Welcome to A Dram of Outlander. This is Desiree, your podcaster and a writer for adramofoutlander.com. Join me for in-depth discussions of the Outlander book series by Diana Gabaldon, the television series, and anything interesting that falls between. This is podcast episode 155, and we are talking about season four, episode 404, Common Ground. It was directed by Ben Bolt, like the last episode, and written by Joy Blake. And the summary goes something like this. Jamie becomes a landowner. Jamie, Claire, and young Ian leave Marsily and Fergus, turning toward the mountains. The boundaries of Fraser's Ridge was are marked. The land is prepared for a cabin. They meet the locals, who are unhappy at their presence. Roger makes a discovery. An awkward phone call ensues. Jamie receives counsel. Jamie believes the land spoke to him. Actions are taken to be peaceable neighbors. A threat bonds them and the Cherokee in friendship. Claire receives a prophecy. Fiona surprises Roger and shares a terrible discovery. Roger finally calls Brianna, but it's too late. So, a few notable things in this episode is primarily that this episode feels like it's a pivot. It's put here in order to build in storylines in the future. There's a minor resolution, but there's so many questions that come up. So, one of the things that we see that I thought was heartfelt and interesting was the fact that Marsley is really missing her mother in this pregnancy, and she and Fergus are staying in town during the pregnancy so they can earn money, but Jamie has put Fergus in charge of locating Highlanders, first off, that they know from Scotland and that maybe were transported from Ardsmere. So can you say he might be fined in Murtaugh? And... They're kind of put on the back burner. But what came out of that exchange between Claire saying goodbye to Marsley is that Claire was humble enough to tell her that Leary did a good job raising her and that she will be a good mother too. I've said that throughout the years, that for all the things that Leary lacks and she is terrible for, she, she did things for her children. She was a good mother. She wanted the best for her daughters, and she wanted that stability, even if in her uh, personal life she wasn't so fabulous and was kind of a mess. Her focus on her daughters was in the right place, and I really like that they had Claire soft enough and relatable enough to give Marcelie that little nugget and that little piece of kindness for her to hold on to because her mother is in Scotland and there's no way to see her. It was also interesting that Marcely made the distinction between Claire being there at the delivery if needed versus being there to help Marcely raise the child. And I'm not quite sure where that's going in context of these characters, but I found it fascinating nonetheless. The other thing that I really liked in this episode, and since I'm not doing a play-by-play recap, I want to kind of jump on the things in the beginning of the podcast before I move into really what kind of struck me, and was the fact that Fiona so lightly told Roger that, well, her grandmother, Mrs. Graham, right? was the caller at the Stones with the dancers. She didn't say she was the new caller, but that she knew the secrets. She knew the stories. She knew the rumors. And then, of course, she knew that Jamie, I'm sorry, Claire went back to find Jamie. Oh, because these walls aren't very thick, right? I think that's kind of hilarious that she was just so la, 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 just like Jamie was. Oh, a ghost walked your shoes. <laughs> to this location so both of us could find it. (laughs) 
And he was like, okay. <laughs> uh, she was just so like, whatever. I liked Roger's reaction, though. He was a bit stunned. And he picked up yet more boxes. I thought he got all the things on his last trip before he went to America for that ill-fated conversation he had with Brianna. So, hmm. I like that. So, is Fiona going to participate more in the future? Does she know that Brianna went to Scotland uh, so she go see her mother? Did she see her when she was there? We don't know. That kind of opens up another avenue as well right there to see how Fiona might contribute or participate or do things for safekeeping in the 20th. So the title of this episode is Common Ground, and this is also an episode where things are a bit obvious, right? <laughs> the Cherokee and the new settlers on Fraser's Ridge are going to be at loggerheads. Okay, like, there's going to be trouble. <laughs> okay. But what does common ground actually mean? Merriam-Webster states that the definition is a basis of mutual interest or agreement. So on the surface, some things appear to be common ground, but they're not in this episode, even though a lot of it's pretty plug and play, right? We're not going to find a lot of things under rocks, I don't think, from this episode. So you may know some that I don't. Oh, and I wanted to backtrack real quick back to Marceline and Claire, is the fact that after Marceline and Claire said goodbye, Claire told Jamie that she was worried about leaving Brianna. She's going to miss everything. And she remembered how much she missed her own mother when she was ready to have Brianna. And Jamie's response was a little weird, where he was like, oh, when I was without you, Sassanok, if he said Sassanok, I can't remember, I would just picture your face. So Brianna has photographs or paintings, whatever, but that's not the same. I don't even know what his lines meant. Like, I kind of tuned him out, because he was trying to make Claire feel better, but what he said to me was kind of weird. It didn't make sense. And as somebody who lost my own mother when I was 10 years old and didn't have her through all the major teenage stuff and getting married and understanding all the things that come with becoming a young woman and having to really figure that stuff out for myself, I had a stepmother, but unfortunately... Not only was she very uneducated, we did not have a harmonious relationship. She really resented the fact that she was my stepmother. And she grew up in the first part of her childhood being heavily abused by her biological father. And even though her mother had remarried somebody who was very kind and was a loving dad to her, she had some deficits. And I totally understand that. It's not a blame game. It just wasn't the relationship where she could step into that maternal role in a comfortable or healthy way for either one of us. It wasn't. Um, it never, ever ended up being that way, being healthy and good for us. So Claire having that moment of really worrying about Brianna's future and oh my goodness my cat is <laughs> climbing the box and that's what you're hearing she so the tenderness that Claire exhibits to Marsley and then her response to her heart for Brianna is really lovely and we're actually getting to see the layers of how Claire is as a mother, and she's not distant, and she wants to be connected. 
So I really appreciate the writers adding that in. And we're getting to see her soften in this season where she doesn't have to be so hard and be so on task. Like we saw her vulnerabilities in season one. And then in season two, I think their characterization of both of them was just chaotic. And she had to be like kind of shrew bitch take charge in season two because Jamie was so unwell. And in season three, she had to have that hard veneer because of the roles that she and Frank had chosen and how they had decided to be in the face of raising Brianna, but not really being in love with each other, though I concede Frank was probably still in love with her, even though she wasn't with him and she couldn't let go of Jamie and receive Frank for who he was and what their marriage was in the same way again. So Claire really had to have that veneer around her and she wasn't able to be soft and squishy very well. She wasn't able to have an air of vulnerability about her. And this season, there has been a distinct air of vulnerability. And she can allow that to be shown. And she can experience it because of her relationship with Jamie. Just like he can have vulnerabilities around her. She doesn't have to be perfect. And she can kind of make stupid decisions, like running after Clarence the Mule, right? She can do it because Jamie's around. So he's her safety net and she's his safety net. But now they can really blossom. And I believe in a good marriage and good relationships, even if they're friendships, we become the best versions of ourselves in these relationships. And in healthy marriages, it doesn't matter what your passion level is. It doesn't matter all of that stuff. Marriages come in all different shapes and sizes, but if they're healthy marriages, I believe you should become the best version of yourself and that the relationships will really support that and sow that within you and your partner or you and your friend or you and your family member. That's what we're supposed to do. And I think that Claire's vulnerability and her tenderness and seeing her fears and her worries and her concerns and her, frankly, not knowing what to do is really good for her and good for us. It gives Jamie the opportunity to really rise up and care for someone who's cared for herself for the most part. It's difficult caring for somebody who is so autonomous in nature. It's difficult to really meet the needs of someone who is, has a tough exterior, the walls that are up. And you think by looking at them, they're fine. They're not fine. They carry deep burdens, and but there's nobody else who's equal in their strength or their courage or whatever you want to call it to help carry that and who would be willing to take those bricks out of their hands. And Claire and Jamie do that for each other. They unburden each other and they help equalize the load. And that's really, I think, why we love the love that they have. And because there's an aspect of it that is critical. They're not in it for themselves. They're in it for each other. And for the two of them together to succeed, even though it's not hard. So I love that very much about this episode is that it just continues to show that. And in Jamie, except for I don't understand what he said to her, you can email me at a contact at a dream of outlander.com or you can leave a voicemail at 719-425-9444. If you can explain that scene to me, his part. But overall, in this episode, we're really getting to see him have his own agency 
I know that's a buzzword, but really come back into himself. And he's able to step into the roles that he finds most important. He's lived as an outlaw and he could just do it for himself. But there's Marceline and Fergus and their baby and there's Claire and there's young Ian and there's Lallybrach and there's Leary and Leary's other daughter. I mean, there's an expanse of people as well as the men and women who are going to come and live on the ridge. So he's finding his purpose again. He's finding his calling. He's able to rise up and be protective and provide security and provide a future. And that's what he's really meant to do. Even though he was the second son, if his brother would have lived, Jamie was still meant to rise up and be this man and to do the hard things and to do the right things. So I'm glad we're actually seeing him blossom. His character has been very just boxed up. And we saw flashes of this man in season one. And then season two, his mental health was never rectified. Like it was never taken care of. The avenue for healing didn't really exist. That upset me a lot because vengeance does not heal your spirit or your soul. And in last season, he was just floundering and he didn't really have a full voice. And Claire came at a time that created chaos and he had all these issues with his sister and Ian and then having to travel across the sea (laughs) and all the complexities that went with that. He was chasing something and he was taking care of a problem he helped create, but he still wasn't able to be himself. He was still an outlaw. He was trying to get to know Claire again and they go under this excessive duress immediately. And so he was kind of mm, treading water, I guess is the term I'd like to use, where he was just trying to keep up and trying to make things right, and all his whole world fell apart. His print shop burnt down. He angered his family. He lost his nephew. He had to divorce a, or get annulled a marriage, right? So there was a, all of those things where he was still only half himself, And he had put his own life into these small boxes. On the front side, he was a printer who was totally on the right side of the law, but then he was also a seditionist and he was also a smuggler. So he was doing things where he never had security or safety and he never could really provide it for anyone else. And he became unstable, like to everyone around him. And that really undermined who he is and what he's meant to do in this life. So having Claire come back and them getting to the colonies for that second chance and for a new lease on life in their middle life, middle age, is really him having a second awakening. And he is able to be who he's supposed to be, just like Claire, and and be a full person. And it's just bloom tremendously. And they're both doing that. And I really appreciate that we're getting to really see his character and see what makes him tick and who he is. I was a little concerned about that, as you know, based on the last two seasons. But now seeing it, there's an equality between him and Claire where he's not sort of hiding behind her skirts. He's really taking command and leading. And that's a specialty of his. Everyone doesn't have it. So that's the little tidbits I want to give. And a disappointment is I'm a little disappointed by the direction that Brianna is taking. Um, and just the affect that she has. I'll get more to that toward the end of the podcast. But that was... I'm not totally sold. I like the actress, Sophie Skelton. I've seen her in other things because I watch a lot of Australian, New Zealand, and UK shows because they're just different than what I'm used to. And I've seen her on those shows. 
And I really like her as an actress. I don't know if I like her in this role. I'm really struggling. I think they have good um, chemistry. But I'm not sure. Her affect can be so flat that I don't know if it's the director, if it's her choice of what she's doing, if it's to create awkwardness. I don't know what the point is behind what she's displaying on screen or not. Or if it's her being a control freak and just trying to control her emotions because of all the trauma and stuff. I don't know. It's frustrating to me, though, because I think her presence is not big. She doesn't look like a Highlander. Her stature is small. So she just doesn't fill the screen like you expect Sam to. Or like Cat does. And even Roger can fill the screen. So I don't know. I don't see the more of her. And it could just be her character development and what they're doing with it. We'll find out. Okay. So... The most obvious common ground scenario is the Indian tribes and the Highlanders. Okay. It was brought up in prior episodes this season. And we know that the prejudice exists about the Cherokee and other tribes by the non-native colonialist peoples. And on our trip to Scotland, one of the things that really unnerved me when we were there was that when we go to the military museums, the Scots were really used as bait. They are considered secondary. The way that they're talked about in the films that they have or recordings, they're really treated like savages. They're called savages. And that was a ploy after the defeat at Culloden of the Highlanders, who were Catholics, the most People in Scotland who have a church affiliation are Presbyterian, the Free Church of Scotland. And outside of Scotland in England, it's Anglican, you know, the Church of England. So most were not Catholic, but there was Catholic influence. And obviously, we ended up with Culloden and following Bonnie Prince. But the way that people would talk about it. And historically, I was shocked. I just sat there and I'm like, are they really speaking this way about the Scots? I mean, very much treated like second-class citizens, all Scots, not just the Highlanders. But it came from the smear campaign of after Culloden and the cleansing of the Highlands and the smashing of the culture and no weapons, no tartan, there could be no more clan chiefs. None of that, right? Decimated the whole culture. Was that this thing of they're unintelligent, they're savage, their accent is horrid and impossible to understand. So there's the, there was this whole social movement against the Scots that hadn't existed really before that I can find. I could be totally wrong about that. And they're the most apologetic people. And it really makes me sad because we'd have conversations and the older the Scott, the more apologetic and what's the word I'm looking for? The people definitely have spirit, but it's just different. It's, there's something that's like, there's some kind of, it almost feels like an oppression. Could that be the weather oppressing them? I don't know. Sure. That's pretty gray. Drik, as they call it. <laughs> but it seems like something more. And there's less of that attitude in Southern Scotland than there is as you head north toward the Highlands and in the Highlands. So it's fascinating to me. And it makes me wonder just how much has been enculturation of them being told they're less than everyone else in the UK. And the demonstration about how less they are. And being called savages and unintelligible. And that their native language of Gaelic is horrible. So I'm not sure. But there are some similarities there. And... 
The Indian tribes are called savages and compared to the Highland Scots by the governor himself after Jamie signs the land agreement. So it's being set up in the episodes we've seen that they should have common ground. They should have they they should be able to be allies or at least understand each other better, right? But there's that just by the governor that racism. <sighs> Hey, hey, colonialism. Gah. The opening scene of the episode also provides a comparison as it shows the Cherokee chief dressing. I'm pretty sure it's the chief, but I could be wrong. It harkens back to the opening scene, and I can't remember which episode. I haven't had a chance to look it up yet. That shows Jamie putting on the Highland gear like dressing with a ritualistic way. And it's funny because my husband happens to have be of massive Viking descent. He's like super Swedish and he's Scottish from two lines. And the way my husband gets ready in the morning, now mind you, he works for a semiconductor company and he's an engineering technician now. <laughs> but he gets dressed in the same ritualistic manner. Do you do that? I do when I'm getting ready to go for a birth, the clothes I put on, exactly the order I put things on, what I need in my pockets. I have a watch on. And, you know, so I love that. Again, there's that tradition that's hearkened back to as well. But it's that kind of ritualistic manner of familiarity that we do things, but it's also for a purpose. And so we had that in the show. And there are also similarities in the ways of life, the clan culture, the ceremonial aspect, the spiritual aspect, that there's a kind of a rule for everything. There's a way to do everything. It all has a purpose that exists between. And there's also a similarity in the difficulties with their way of life being compromised by encroachment, war, and politics. Because you don't speak this way or dress this way, you must be less than and a savage. It's exactly what the Scots were told, the Highland Scots, and that's exactly what all the different tribal peoples of what's now the United States of America have been told. And it got worse and worse and worse for them. And it's the outcome of that, as I've talked to you about when we hit, did the books, is still shattering. And I... It is something that is just now being legitimately and honestly spoken of, though there's still much missing from our textbooks that doesn't whitewash everything. So this, of course, is a highly simplistic comparison, and I urge you to do your research on the history of the Cherokee and other tribes, and really doing your own comparison of what the culture and life was like. It's so rich and beautiful. And at the end of the written post that goes with the podcast, I did put in several different links, um, and some were on the Cherokee Nation, just to give you a foundation of what still exists today. It's fascinating to me, and I'm really glad that those structures are in place because they were very much decimated, and it continued well into the 20th century. So it wasn't just something that happened before. It's something that's happened often and ongoing. And so that comparison brings me to a side note. And Jamie wanting this land for his and his family's greater purpose and reclamation of all that was lost, believing the land spoke to him, coupled with his desire to be a good and peaceable neighbor, creates conflict in me. The land is available because of deals the colonialists have made with the Cherokee. Jamie is now the governor's man, and by extension, the crown's man. He is the face of colonialism, the face of Western ex Europe, of Western Europe's expansionism. Can one be a kinder, gentler colonialist? 
or rather take advantage of a colonialist offering and not be an oppressor? I know, some pretty deep questions. (laughs) I know this is a modernist view, and who wouldn't jump at the chance to finally have something of value and worth? Who wouldn't seek the avenue of legacy? Jamie Fraser is a good man who wants to do what is right and just. He strives to have a solid moral compass. Jamie Fraser is also a man who prizes his family's safety, security, and prosperity above all else, including his own. He's had so little ability in his life to take care of those in his charge without usurping the law or being un an unstable caretaker. I know that's a lot in that paragraph, but I sat here and thought he he feels called to this land, the mountains, though very different than the Scottish Highlands where there's not a lot of trees. And it's definitely not warm like that. It still calls to the Highland spirit. And I did put a link in from North Carolina Pedia that talks about the Highland Scots. And as I've said before, there was a huge influx of Scots into that Cape Fear region. And they continued to, I mean, there's been some mass immigrations from Scotland into that very place. And there are a lot of surnames that are Scottish still today in North Carolina. So that's to me, again, it gives me conflict in the sense of, does, do ends justify the means? Do you take a gift knowing that you will likely have to do things that you go against? Do you take a gift for the long game and you just hope that you can spin it into something positive and that it's worth the penalty? So sure, they're on the correct side of the boundary line because that had been negotiated with the tribes far earlier than them arriving. But is it still okay? Is it still okay that they're getting 10,000 acres of this land? I mean, in the beginning of the episode, the Cherokees certainly didn't think so, right? They were like, I know the boundary line's over there, but we don't care. All they knew is somebody, strangers, Western Europeans were encroaching on their boundary line and into the lands that they have freely traveled always. It's a part of American history, including Canadian history, that is very dark, very dark. And I don't know of any country that doesn't have a history that you can just cringe over in some aspect. Our two huge things were definitely colonialism and racism. And it's, yeah, it's hard. It's hard. That's why we have to talk about it and say, I think they handled it really well in the TV show, just to show the initial disquiet and discontent between them. So what do you think about that? I mean, uh, because your eye is on a positive reason and a good end, could you in good conscience take that land? I mean, I think if I lived in the time, I probably wouldn't wouldn't question it too much because even Claire is not questioning it and she's seen all of it (laughs) and she's still like okay because of what the promise is uh, that's a pretty big penalty and they can't change what has already happened so does that make it less of a conflict I don't know I'm just bringing it up because The 21st century me is like, (laughs) ah, but I don't know if the late 20th century me would have thought anything of it. 
because it was already there and established. So what are you going to do? Not use it. If they don't take it, somebody else will. I just think there's ethical and moral questions. I don't know if they can ever be answered. I'm certain not in the context of my little podcast, but it's worth being thoughtful and us discussing it nonetheless. So send me an email or a voicemail, and I want to hear what you think about that because this is not white guilt that we hear so much about. My thing is, is looking at it and saying, through any philosophical lens, like, is that okay? Or was it simply, that's how it was? So you took advantage of a situation to get from one place to another and to do good by it. I don't know. So they did have to find common ground. And I think the episode did a great job in showing that friction. I mean, it showed the growing pains of having settlers on the land, whether or not they were on the right side of the boundary lines. The local Cherokees do not take kindly to Jamie and Claire while they are clearing an area to build a shed and cabin. They even go so far as to threaten them with the return of several landmarker poles, saying, I don't care what your government piece of paper says. This land is not owned by anybody. This is all our land. Gosh, if only it could be so. Jamie has no issues having his family brandish weapons when the Cherokee approach, yet in good wisdom seeks counsel to somehow establish a harmonious and peaceful relationship between his family and the Cherokee. He has 10,000 acres, and he is going to bring in families, many families, to homestead this whole area. But right now, his primary concern is for the safety, security, and prosperity of Claire, him, and young Ian, and to get something off the ground for when those people start coming. John Quincy Myers promises to take a gift of tobacco from Jamie as an offering to the Cherokee. But Jamie inadvertently finds the better alternative to forging a respectful and seemingly healthy relationship. (laughs) He kills the bear that has been wreaking havoc in the area. It isn't an ordinary bear, though. It's a shunned Cherokee who has taken on the spirit, skin, and claws of a bear. To the Cherokee, he is dead so they have no means to kill him, to kill what they call the Skeliona. So he's basically like a spirit monster bear, (laughs) human. When the bear attacked friend John Quincy Myers and mauled him seriously and threatened continuously in the forest, Jamie goes on the hunt. He discovers it is a bear man when it attacks him. He ironically kills the monster with one of the landmarker poles. Yep. When he returns the corpse to the Cherokee, they accept it and begin to respect his place on this land. So Jamie spent the night, fought this thing, and because it was wearing the bear claws, he's gouged in his arm. And so he gets the corpse with all the bear skin and the claws and everything, this man, and drags it to the Cherokee. I don't know how far that is. They'd been riding horses whenever they'd visited. And he shows him that he killed him and they said they explained why they couldn't kill him that he was already dead to them but he kept coming back and bothering them over and over again and jamie killing him was a good thing the man had gone mad after he had been shunned and sent out of the village so he's getting some 
respect and they figure out that he's a man of honor and he could have simply just killed the man and buried him, right? But he wanted to bring him back to what he thought was his people. We don't see what kind of burial or anything that they do. And from here, the Cherokee offers friendship to Jamie, Claire, and young Ian. And they're already friends with John Quincy Myers. And the chief names Jamie Bear Killer. And this will be the name he is known by within the Cherokee tribe. So anybody who talks about him, they will now call him Jamie Fraser or the man from Fraser's Ridge. They'll say bear killer and everyone will know. And it's an esteemed place to be as a great hunter and a warrior. So now he's setting the tone for who he is in their community and that they can rely on each other. And he's upstanding and good. And he's willing to do the hard things. <laughs> So I said that Jamie now has mountain cred instead of street cred. <laughs> Through his actions, a bond of mutual respect is formed. So they come into their area where the cabin is being built. And they talk together and they start getting to know each other. So we'll see who's going to be speaking Cherokee, whether it's young Ian or whether it's Jamie or both. We already know John Quincy Myers knows the language. And then Claire also finds some common ground with Ottawehi. She's the grandmother, the healer in the tribe, not the grandmother, a grandmother in the tribe. And I did not get the pronunciation for the young woman whose husband is her grandson. I don't know if it's a G or a G sound. So I'm going to leave it until someone tells me how to say it. I didn't catch it on the show. And I tried to look it up and there was no pronunciation guide that I could find. But she speaks English as well as Cherokee. And she's translating for Claire. And this young woman, the granddaughter-in-law, tells Claire that Adawehi dreams of Claire and gives her a prophecy that she will have great power when her hair turns all white, white as snow. She is, she is the medicine now, but she will have great power and wisdom. She also tells Claire something ominous about death coming that won't be her fault. Death comes from the gods. It won't be your fault that sounds kind of rough and scary. We'll see what that means. But Claire kind of just looks at her like, okay, I don't understand. But then she invites them to sit with her. And Claire is going to be able to communicate with Ottawehi, who for book readers, that's Nyaweni, um, in the Tuscarora. But we're using Cherokee in the show. And she's going to learn all the local herbs, plants, everything that she can use for healing, things that she can never know on her own. So they're going to share, and this is the beginning of a really beautiful and deep relationship that they have. So I suspect that Claire will become a very strong herbalist from this, and it will increase her healing ability in the 18th century. Common ground is also secured between Jamie and Claire. Again, they're finally being able to, even though it's hard work, settle into life together and grow together and kind of find their balance. I mean, Jamie maps out their new cabin that includes a clinic room and storage space for Claire to see patients. He's considering both their needs in the design. This is the Jamie we expect and adore. And on the flip side, Claire has been practicing target shooting. So she'll be able to take care of their homestead in the event that no one else is around in case there's a real bear 
or other types of threats. So Claire is making decisions that are going to benefit the whole of them and not just her. So that was also something I really liked. Um, it just was building their foundation as they build their cabin. So where does common ground lack in this episode? The painful awkwardness between Roger and Brianna when he calls to tell her the discovery about her mother and Jamie. She's cool and distant to Roger, while seeming to be less than enthused at the news. You'd think she'd be more excited and express deep crat deep gratitude for him continuing to research into the past on her behalf. What's a guy have to do to get a rise from her? After Roger finds out, Fiona knows about Claire being a traveler and sharing devastating news from an article she found in her grandmother's belongings. They also disagree on whether Roger should tell Brianna about the obituary with the blurred date. He and Fiona argue a little bit about it. And he's known Fiona for a long time because she was Mrs. Graham's granddaughter. And Mrs. Graham was the housekeeper for Reverend Wakefield. She did everything for him. And Fiona took stepped into that position when her grandmother died. So they have a history. And... They argued, and Roger was sure that he couldn't say anything to her and devastate her more. However, it doesn't end there. Roger decides to phone Brianna at some point after, we don't know how long, but is told she left for Scotland a couple of weeks ago to visit her mother. Whoa, this takes Roger completely off guard. She never told him or contacted him. The divide between them grows. Was he calling her to tell her about the obituary? How much time had passed since Fiona shared it with him? Why was Brianna traveling into the past without telling Roger? From this vantage point, I think he has a right to be angry. I'm assuming he was calling to tell her finally. Like his conscience got the better of him, but it was too late. I don't know. It's going to be interesting to see how this unfolds because we do see in the, that she was going to the stone. She was at Craig Dune. Two weeks. So was that why she was so cool and distant? Which she, Was she already planning to go through the stones? Had she found the obituary? I don't know. We'll see. The other area where common ground lacks is in Tryon's views of the regulators and the Indians. He stands for King and Crown, where Jamie is using the land grant for his purposes, knowing he'll have to choose sides in the future when the American Revolution breaks out. So I think Jamie's, I mean, absolutely using Tryon, and he's going to get entrenched and do the bare minimum of what he has to do to uphold his, uphold his end of the bargain in the backcountry. But Jamie doesn't believe in all the taxes, and Jamie doesn't believe in all that stuff, or even the laws as they stand. So it'll be interesting how he takes his own personal ethics and morals and apply it to what Governor Tryon expects from him. Okay. What else did you see? Was there something I'm missing? Any thoughts? Any questions? Any criticisms? <laughs> 719-425-9444 or email is contact at adramaoutlander.com and the last thing is into the future so this episode resolves one serious issue that of the friction between the locals and the new settlers but it opens up pathways to many unanswered questions will Roger discover when and why Brianna time traveled been a couple weeks, but can he figure out the exact date she went? Will Brianna find her parents? Why didn't Brianna tell Roger? 
Will Roger follow Brianna into the past? Will life be calm on Fraser's Ridge now that friendship is secured between the Cherokee and those on the ridge? When will we see Marcelie and Fergus again? Who will Fergus recruit to live on Fraser's Ridge? How long before Governor Tryon calls in favors from Jamie and his men in the backcountry? Hmm. So I really liked this episode. I think it had the purpose of giving us direction towards future storylines and character development, but it definitely left more unanswered questions than answered. And there always has to be those transitional episodes in any kind of show. But again, I'd like to hear from you. So the links I also put in here, I have three different links on North Carolina land grants and the land process. Uh, They're interesting. One of them you can actually search. And if you have family from that region, you could put your family's name in there and search on any land grant that were given. And one thing that stood out for me when I was reading through the websites is that when the American Revolution broke out and the government's land grant office closed, North Carolina did an interesting thing. So they joined the, what, the resistant, the rebels? (laughs) Okay, they became patriots because they were not for the crown any longer. And when the land grant office reopened, it was to an independent state of Carolina. And anybody who was on occupied lands already got to keep the lands, as well as any lands that were not settled, people were able to apply for grants. It's very interesting to look at how they did it They could have kicked people off of the lands, and one of the lichpins to them choosing to do what they did as a colony was because the crown wanted to take back everything that had ever been granted, and everything was supposed to revert to the crown. Nope. (laughs) That's a big nope from us. People had been settling those lands for 100 years, 150 years, and uh uh-uh, they weren't going back. So it's some fascinating reading. I know that my friend Gina has a huge family history in that area, and there's actually land ownership still in her family in the mountains. I want to go visit, like, her family's acreage and to see it. But she could tell stories, and people in her family were part of so many interesting things. I, I want to have her on the podcast so she can explain all the awesome things that people in her family, people she knows, um, have participated in in the state of North Carolina and before it was a state. So where can you find a drama of Outlander? Go on Facebook, and you can follow the page, or you can join the group. The group you have is closed, so you have to answer three questions, and then you join. We have lots of interesting conversations, and people are great in there. So come on over and join us. On Twitter and Instagram, it's Dram of Outlander. Of course, the website is adramofoutlander.com, and check it out because Jan posts about a piece a week. And she's a really excellent writer. Thank you, Jan. She's really creating some good content surrounding the show. And it's different than what you're going to see elsewhere. I love how her brain works. How can you help the show? Well, you can support the show by, number one, participating on social media, joining the Facebook group and page, coming and talking with other Outlander fans. The next way you support the show is to share the podcast. Share it with other people. Bring other people to it. And go into what 
whatever place that you stream from. If it happens to be Apple Podcasts, go in through iTunes and leave a review. Spotify, Google Play, I'll go in and leave a review for me. And for every like the five star, the highest rating, it helps people find me, which I appreciate. We had a ridiculous amount of downloads for the episodes for this season so far. I'm like, wow, it's really fun. I can't imagine so many people listening to me, listening to me, my opinions and my voice for that much. And thank you for sticking with me through this aftermath of that cold where I lost my voice again, second one this year. And the final way you can support the podcast is financially. Every dollar counts. You can go to patreon.com slash a dram of Outlander, or you can send a one-time offering. If you drop me an email or a phone call, I can let you know how that is. I pay for everything out of pocket. If you'd like to sponsor the show, let me know. If you create any sort of Outlander-inspired products or anything related, I'd love to hear from you. Or you can request a media kit from me, and I will send it to you so you can see what the kind of numbers are, etc. And that's it for the show. I'm super excited to see what the rest of the season has to offer. It's kind of had some bumpy moments, and it's been awesome and been funky, and we're getting there. I think this this season is hitting its stride earlier, and... Um, Patricia posted in the Facebook group all the titles for the the upcoming episodes. And some of them I cannot figure out. I will post it on um, Instagram and see if we can come up with who, what, why, where, when. Because <laughs> I'm like, I have no idea. Because some of the stuff has already been out of time sync to the book material. So... We kind of have like a little bit of ability to see in the future if you're a book reader, but you have no idea what the writer's room is going to do. Like Otter Tooth, the ghost, that was not supposed to happen for a long time. So now we're like, I don't know. <laughs> so it's like having uh, the ability to read the future, but being like totally wrong half the time. <laughs> and we can't trust our sight. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. Okay. So thank you so much for listening and thank you for supporting the show and thank you for downloading every week. And until next time, Slangeva.